World Cup top scorer Gary Lineker made history as the most expensive British footballer ever, signing from Everton to Barcelona for £2.75 million. But just 24 hours later, the record was smashed as his opposite number at Liverpool, Welsh striker Ian Rush, signed for Juventus for £3.2 million, only to be immediately loaned back to Liverpool for the 1986-87 season. And in Moscow, the 1986 Goodwill Games opened. Media tycoon Ted Turner had organised the Games in response to the boycotts of the 1980 Moscow and 1984 Los Angeles Olympics, and represented the first time American and Soviet top athletes would compete against each other in a decade since the 1976 Montreal Games. Not that the Games were entirely apolitical, of course. The Soviet authorities banned teams from Israel and South Korea from entering, and enacted a major lockdown of Moscow, not allowing any non-Muscovites to enter. All of which meant that Ted Turner made a major loss on the Games, but it was still planned to hold the next edition in 1990 in Seattle. With just a week between Formula 1 races, the teams had little time to watch athletics though, and the British sporting press were in full-on Mansellmania mode to boot. Nigel had won three of the last four races and six of the last twelve since he broke his winner's duck at Brands Hatch here some nine months ago. Mansell could also leave Brands on top of the driver's table if he scored more points than Prost. The British fans were also heartened to see Frank Williams back in the Williams pit, looking fairly well and happy as his recovery continued. And what's his reaction to his overwhelming reception? Um, one of great stimulation. I'm, I feel normal. Um, maybe I'm not quite as mobile as I would like to be, but I'm enjoying being here very, very much indeed. And I'm glad that the team is going very well without me because I do also at the same time feel a bit rusty. Everything's happening a bit quickly for me. Very emotional day for you today because I've been, I've been watching everybody in the world coming up wanting to talk to you. Good for you. That's very nice. Emotional perhaps, but my voice is having a hard time. It wasn't all good news for the British teams though. Renault had announced that it would withdraw from Formula 1 at the end of the season, citing the uncertainty over the future of turbo engines, leaving Lotus and Tyrrell looking for a new supplier, as well as Ligier, who had already announced a three-year deal with Alfa Romeo for a new engine, while Lotus were rumoured to be talking to Honda, who might even be looking to buy the team outright. On the subject of Ligier, long-term driver Jacques Lafitte was to make his 176th Grand Prix start at Brands Hatch which would equal Graham Hill's all-time record. Amid news that the British Grand Prix had been awarded to Silverstone for the next five years, in accordance with FISA's new policy of long-term contracts over alternating arrangements, and that this would be the last race at Brands Hatch for a while, the stands were absolutely packed all weekend under gorgeous sunshine. Even Friday practice and qualifying attracted over 50,000 people. To help them keep track of proceedings for the first time, a couple of large screens had been erected to display the BBC television coverage. Nelson Piquet's fans had been muttering about him being sidelined by Williams, and if he was feeling that himself, he made the best response possible by dominating practice and qualifying, finishing top of Friday's standings a half-second ahead of Berger's second-place Benetton. On Saturday, Mansell went out to try and outdo him, but was suffering a slight misfire at full boost and had to run slightly under, meaning he couldn't do any better than second. Brabham, meanwhile, held their nose and sent Patrese out in last year's BT-54 chassis to see if it went any better than the problematic BT-55, only for him to be a full four seconds off Piquet's time in the same car last year. Patrese may not be Piquet, but in the same car in 1983 they were usually close, and it was a big enough gap for the Brabham team to look aghast and unable to understand what on earth was going wrong. So with the Williamses on row one, with Nelson Piquet taking his 20th career pole, Ayrton Senna took third, while Berger wasn't able to beat his Friday time and would line up fourth. On row three with the McLarens, Rosberg might have done better but got in an accident with Lafitte, who held his hands up and admitted fault, and given he could only manage 19th himself, Rosberg couldn't be too upset. Fabi and Arnoux were on row four, then three Brits, Warwick, Dumfries and Brundle in 9th through 11th places. Alboreto and Johansson were 12th and 18th in the ailing Ferrari, Alboreto after a Saturday fire and Johansson with a spin, with the usual suspects at the back, with Allenberg slowest of all. 11.7 seconds off pole and nearly 2 seconds off Rottengatter in front of him. Race day saw a flyover by one of the RAF's Vulcan bombers recently taken out of mothballs for the Falklands War and a popular site at air shows with its distinctive delta wings and deafening howl, and then it was time to go. 
PK got away well, but Mansell seemed to stagger off the line, dropping behind Senna and Berger into fourth. But behind them, there was a large accident as Bootson's arrows snapped left for some reason, hit the barriers, bounced off them, and collected several other cars, including Jonathan Palmer, who as a qualified doctor hopped out and started checking on the other drivers. It became obvious that Jacques Lafitte was stuck in his cockpit and in quite a bit of pain. The race was red flagged and would be started again, which was a bonus for Mansell, who had broken something in the car at the start and would now be able to start in the spare, which was being hurriedly changed over from Piquet's settings to Mansell's. Jacques Lafitte was finally extracted from his cockpit nearly an hour after the incident and airlifted off to Sidcup Hospital with several fractures to both legs and his pelvis, and the restart couldn't then take place until a helicopter returned. Finally, though, the start could be retaken with four cars missing, as well as Lafitte, Bootson was starting in the spare Arrows, leaving Dana without a ride, and with Alan Berg having rented the spare Azella for his race drive, both Azellas being caught in the incident, neither of them would start. Both Minardis had also been caught up in it, but could take the restart with Nanini starting from the pit lane after some last-minute repairs to his race car. This time, they all got away well, with Mansell holding on to second place ahead of Berger, Senna and the McLarens, but not for long as the Austrian elbowed his way past the local hero at Pilgrim's Drop and set about attacking Piquet for the lead. Mansell quickly got the hang of the spare Williams and stayed close to Piquet and Berger before retaking second on lap three. Before long, the two Williamses were pulling away from the Benetton, who in turn looked safe enough from the battle for fourth between Senna and Rosberg. PK looked comfortable in the lead, slowly pulling away from Mansell as Rosberg came in to post the first retirement of the second start with a fritzed gearbox. So now it was PK, Mansell, Berger, Senna, Prost, Fabi, Alboreto, Arnu, Jones and Warwick in the top ten, and on lap 11 the leaders were already encountering the first back markers, which allowed Mansell to close up on his teammate. Further back, Prost slowly closed in on Senna as Bootson came in to have something on the spare arrows looked at, and then at about one-third distance, Prost came in for new tyres, having been unhappy with the balance of his starting set, emerging ninth just ahead of Petrese, still in last year's Brabham, who surged past to drop Prost to tenth for the moment, while just ahead of them were Jones and Warwick scrapping over seventh. Johansson blew his engine on lap 20 as Mansell continued to follow in Piquet's wheel tracks, and a couple of laps later he was passed. Piquet wasn't going to let that go, and stuck to the back of his teammate like a sweaty t-shirt as the pair of them lapped Streff in the camera-equipped Tyrrell. At one-third distance on lap 25, Mansell thus led Piquet by a few car lengths, with Senna third, Alboreto up to fourth, with Arnu, Warwick and Petrese making up the top six. As Berger walked in having lost his electrics out on the circuit, and Andrea de Cesaris retired with a similar problem. The two different Brabhams, Warwick in the BT-55, leading Petrese in the BT-54, were running close together, and Prost had rapidly caught them, making a three-way fight for the last point. They were also the last cars not yet to have been lapped by the Williams cars, and Prost would no doubt be keen to get past the Brabhams before that happened. Senna came in on lap 28, but what looked like a routine stop went on much longer, as Senna gesticulated and talked to race engineer Steve Hallam before the team clustered round the rear of the car. He had been having some gear selection problems, and after five minutes stationary was sent out again, his race ruined, only to lose fourth gear and retire shortly afterwards. Prost, meanwhile, didn't seem to be making much impression on the Brabhams as they all moved up a spot, and now had Mansell gaining on him. Prost had always seemed to have a bad time at Brands Hatch, and it looked like 1986 would be no exception. PK came in for a good tyre stop on lap 30, and Mansell was in two laps later for an equally good one, getting out still in the lead, but only just. PK now had a couple of laps of advantage to get past, while Mansell's tyres were getting up to temperature. Nigel was able to fend him off, and the pair had a great scrap over the next few laps as they made their way through traffic. Arnu came in on the stroke of half distance from third, which allowed Prost past as Petrese's encouraging race in last year's car ended with a blown engine after 39 laps. So the order as the race entered its final third was Mansell leading Piquet, with Prost a rather distant third, Alboreto fourth, then Arnu, Warwick, Fabi, Tombe, Brundle, Streff, Dumfries, who just stopped, and Palmer. The scrap between Mansell and Piquet had died down a little as both had eased off, with Nelson gathering himself for another go, and both dialling down the boost a little to ensure they'd have enough fuel to go to the end, though not enough to stop Mansell breaking the lap record on lap 40. 
When Mansell was slightly balked, lapping Brundle, PK closed right up once more as Prost came in for a second stop, a slightly tardy 11 seconds which saw him stay third. The Ferrari mechanics got ready to receive fourth-placed Alboreto, but his turbo had gone out on the circuit and he was out, in his fifth retirement of nine races so far. Arnoux's stop promoted Derek Warwick to fourth, with Arnoux fifth and Patrick Tombe now sixth in the Haas Lola, and the Tyrrells once more just out of the points in seventh and eighth. By this time, the Williams cars had lapped the entire field, and were still running tightly together as Arnoux retook fourth from Warwick, just as Nigel and Nelson arrived to put a second lap on both of them. With 15 laps to go, the relentless pace hadn't let up, and Mansell turned his boost up a little to try and put a little fresh air between himself and Piquet, setting another lap record on lap 63 of 1 minute 9.808 seconds, an average speed of a smidge under 135 miles an hour, 217 kilometers an hour, while Brundle had made his way up into the points, courtesy of Tombe's gearbox failing. If Piquet had planned to mount an attack on Mansell in the closing laps, Mansell wasn't going to give him a chance, breaking the lap record again and pulling away to take the win by 5.5 seconds as PK just wasn't able to stay with him. Prost came in a distant third with our new fourth and Warwick was looking set fair for fifth until he ran out of fuel on the last lap so Brundle and Streff took the final points, though Philippe nearly lost his point to Johnny Dumfries as he slowed to deal with a loose steering wheel on the last corner. Mansell was roared back to the podium on the tailgate of a course Range Rover to take the plaudits after his second win at Brands Hatch and his first British Grand Prix. He was very dehydrated, the spare Williams had no drink bottle fitted, but nonetheless looked delighted, while Nelson looked distinctly green around the gills. If this was to be the last Grand Prix at Brands Hatch, it had certainly been one to remember, both for the estimated 100,000 people at the circuit and the millions more watching on TV around the world.